All right. We're here tonight with David Ryder Prangley. How are you doing today, David? I'm kind of okay. I'm going a bit um, lockdown loco, I think, is the only expression I can use. The double L. I like it. Yeah, oh. I feel like I've entered another dimension and I, I can't find the, the way out. You seem like you might like that sort of thing. Well, I like it if I choose to enter the dimension, but I feel this is not of my choice, which is, you know, nothing I can do about it. Mm. And hence, it not being my choice. So, Indeed. So how are you dealing with the lockdown? I'm, I'm doing all right, all things considered, you know. I, mean, I wish people would wear masks and, you know, pay attention to what's do going on. Do you want to wear a mask now? Would that help? Well, I think we're pretty safe. And we are, what, okay. like 3,000 miles apart over the internet, so... I mean, we are, but um, I hear a rumor that it can, the virus can travel through the internet. That sounds like... Yeah, well, not my words, I'm just saying. Hopefully that's as Depeche Mode said, a blasphemous rumor. Maybe Dave Garn started it. Ooh. I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to think so. But speaking of other dimensions... You recently put out your first solo album, Black Magic and True Love. I did, yeah. I actually have a copy of it right here. Oh, let's so, see. For illust illustration purposes only. So. The 12 inch, nice. So here it is. Yeah, very sleek. Now, so this is actually a picture of a um, Victorian prostitute that I found in a flea market, and it bears a remarkable similarity. It does bear a remarkable similarity. Me. Wow. I mean, it was so, just meant to be, I guess, you know. It was, yeah, yeah. for a reason. <laughs> and, Indeed. So. I mean, speaking of Victorian prostitutes, well, I guess, maybe not speaking of Victorian prostitutes, but you released this on Valentine's Day. I did, yes. Yeah, yeah. That is, um, yeah, I don't know. Is there some special deal that Victorian prostitutes would give out on Valentine's Day? I'm not sure. That but I don't know. I mean, we'd have to ask a historian. Yeah, or get a Ouija board out. Which Had we be. prepared, maybe we can, maybe next time. Next time for sure. Next time we will speak to the dead. So, um, yeah, I put it out on Valentine's Day because I thought that was um, just an appropriate day to put it out. The yeah. Day, the saint of true love. Which is in the title. Which is in the title. So, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been digging the album, man. It reminds me of like if Lady Stardust released a solo album. I get that type of feel from it. Wow. That's, um, is, is that Lady Stardust as in the David Bowie's friend or Andy Scott from The Sweets friend? No, it's in the, it's in the song, the character Lady Stardust. Oh, yes. Song, okay. Yeah, yeah. Song. Yeah. Uh, Lady Starlight is the Andy Scott one. Sorry. Hmm. I've totally ruined my glam credentials there. Oh, well, we can edit this out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't put that in. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, thank you. Um, yeah, the, um, the songs are quite, some of them are really old, actually. I, I wrote them uh, kind of when my, my band, Rachel Stamp, kind of, kind of split up um, around about 2003, I think. And um, I did some gigs, and some of the songs actually go back to then, and others are, are, are written very, very recently. So, and I wanted to, you know, talking about entering another dimension, I wanted to take the listener into another dimension, but one that was pleasant and one that they chose to go into. So. <laughs> I think you succeeded. Thank I, you very much. I, I appreciate feeling. that. So yeah, speak. I mean, you've been in many different bands and projects. What was the impetus to to do this now? Well, I think the fact that I, I had all these songs I'd written and, and they were just there and nobody had ever really heard them unless they'd been at the shows that I did uh, some years back. And I just thought this is the time to do it. I just need to put it out. And um, I had a, like sort of band together because um, I've, I've been playing in a band called Sister Witch with a singer called Lux Lyle and um, that kind of transformed into uh, Lux Lyle's solo project um, and that was less uh, that revolved less around a, 
a band and more of around these big sort of orchestral arrangements. So um, the people that have been in the Sister Witch Band, I sort of said to them, hey, you want to learn these songs and come in and make an album with me? So that's essentially what, what I did. So it was kind of like a band that was up and running. Um, uh, and we went to the studio and set up and recorded everything uh, pretty much live as it went down. You know, all the bass, drums and guitars all went down at the same time. Oh, cool. Then we sort of uh, rewound the, the Pro Tools and did all the kind of hand claps and all that kind of stuff and percussion and things. And um, yeah, it was all done very quickly. I, I wanted it to be, uh, you know, quick, not hang around. You get that kind of vibe on the on the on the on the music, you know. Didn't really fix things up too much. There was, you know, listen very closely to the guitar player, and you'll know what I mean. So, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> now the first tune, they came from the stars to capture our hearts. Yes. Is the they mentioned in the title, the spaceman and the star child, Mr. Ace Freely and Paul Stanley? Wow, that's a really good question. I'm not sure, I should, that's a really good interpretation. One that I may or may not have thought of before. Um, wow. I, if, if you look here, I don't know if you can see at the end of my thumb, there is actually a picture oh, of whoa. Kiss. <laughs> it's a mirror, it's a Kiss mirror. And above it is a heart-shaped mirror. And then behind that then are some heart-shaped panels from a spaceship. Not heart-shaped, mirror spaceship panel. They're not really spaceship panels. I made that up. So um, I was busy having my mind blown by the yeah, <laughs> so kids just appearing at their mention. Yeah, they, yeah, that's what happens. So mention any other band, they'll just, they'll just pop into view. So uh, oh, <laughs> um, use this power wisely. Yes. So I think that um, that's a really good question. That's not actually what the song is about the song is actually about it's based on a short story that i came up with um so i've been reading a lot of um are you familiar with michael moorcock oh um, yeah so I, i've read not much of his stuff but i was re reading the um the jerry cornelius um stories which i think are just amazing and oh, i wow. wanted to come up with just this sort of very short science fiction story which is basically about um the human race as it is wakes up one day and aliens have landed and the aliens are these just amazingly beautiful creatures like nothing anybody's ever seen before and everybody who lays eyes on them falls in love with them so and the human race is suddenly no one can function or do anything because they're literally just completely besotted with these creatures dot 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 So yeah, that's what that one's about. Uh, you, I, you sort of rev things up with trouble every day. Now, is that about the shampoo song? That's a good question because I love shampoo. I don't know if I ever, I've, I've got a great story about shampoo where um, uh, in the uh, mid nineties, I just moved to London and um, me and my friend Abs um, used to go clubbing all the time. And we were just sort of like, quite nervous people who just kind of turned up in London. It was like I had kind of pink hair and my friend Abs had this enormous quiff. And it was kind of at a time when not that many people were looking very glamorous. It was kind of still the Britpop, dowdy kind of thing. And we used to get loads of grief whenever we went out, you know, just people, you know, we just used to, it was crazy. Anyway, one night we were in a club and, um, and Shampoo were there. So I just went over and started talking to them. And um, I think it was, uh, I, I used to wear a swatch. Remember swatches? Oh yeah. <laughs> so I had a swatch and um, I just said to her, look, I'm wearing a swatch. And she took some bubble gum out of her mouth and just stuck it on my swatch. Yikes. <laughs> so that, that's my shampoo story. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I still have the swatch, but unfortunately no longer have the bubble gum. Oh, man. So. <laughs> you got any more to say about this, that song itself? Um, 
I think that, um, I don't know, I get this, I, um, I guess that song is kind of one of those, you know, I, I noticed recently that, that in our age of kind of political correctness and things, people don't really write those sort of quite irresponsible rock and roll songs anymore, you know, that are just kind of narcissistic. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, it's like that, you know, that Rolling Stones song, um, Live With Me, you know, that, that song? Yeah, I haven't it's heard got it this line, you know, uh, you'd look good pram pushing down the high street, which is obviously just a completely ridiculous kind of sexist line. But you've got like Mick Jagger saying it. So it's like, what the hell this guy, what this guy saying, <laughs> you know, and, um, and I kind of wanted to write a song that was kind, kind of like written from the point of view of like a complete asshole, basically. <laughs> uh, and um you know, and also I think it's it's really important to write songs that people can identify with. And it's kind of when, you know, we're all guilty of bad self-indulgent behavior at certain points. And I think that song is for people who act that way and are kind of in the throes of remorse for their actions. Wow. So it's kind of written from that point of view, I guess. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. Not the next tune, Forever and Starlight, is very Twin Peaks. -y. Oh, wow. Well, it's interesting because I um, watched Twin Peaks for the first time um, only like a year and a half ago. I'd never actually seen it. Um, and I just, I watched it all just in, in one, one go, the entire thing. And it drove me a bit crazy because it's really scary. Yeah it's really disturbing and um it was you know and the music in it is obviously just wonderful mm. um is it uh angelo bad badly elemente so yeah and it's great and julie cruz and um that yeah that's um uh, that's uh, but i think i actually wrote that song before i'd seen twin peaks so but not long before i'd seen twin peaks so maybe in a twin peaks style time schism mm. <laughs> really i did write it after i'd seen twin peaks Oof. but before i'd seen twin peaks <laughs> other dimensions with you yeah yeah who knows <laughs> now yeah. you got that line in that song when you make sense of senseless things like i never really listened to senseless things were like they that part of a band to figure out um the, even though I'm aware of the senseless things and um, and I like the band, that song was um, it was and obviously it's when I sang the line, it's I knew people were going to think of the band, the senseless things, but it was more to do with um, like Alice in Wonderland. Ah, you know, um, I'm, I'm probably totally misquoting Alice in Wonderland, but it's kind of like one of the one of the limericks or one of the poems from. Uh, the, like cabbages and kings and all that kind of that stuff. Mm. You know, I mean, this is how I kind of come up with things: is I misremember uh, stuff from my past and I write it down, and it comes out as something different. So. But in terms of the sense of things being hard to understand, I'm not. I'm not really sure. I think it's in the ear of the behold of the beholder. The ear of the beholder. I like that. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Do you think the sense of things are? hard to understand i've never really listened to them uh I, they weren't really big in the states or that i i never really heard of them so uh no i think they were they were it's interesting i think they were as far as i know a very british phenomenon but they actually yeah. reformed a couple of years back and sold out a bunch of gigs you know oh. so um so i guess lots of people could understand them it could make sense yeah or maybe they would they just didn't didn't care yeah I don't I understand this, but I love it. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes it's best not to understand yeah. pop music. Because when you do, it spoils it a lot of the time. <laughs> so, yeah. Now you're talking about doing all stuff uh, pretty much a one take before. Captain Sugar is the, the epic, like 11 yeah. minute album closer. That was totally one take because it's so long. <laughs> that to just do it all again would be like, why, why are we doing this? <laughs> 
but um yeah that was that was very much i mean we did we did yeah all the um uh yeah guitars bass drums all down at the same time um the sax was put on afterwards and some of the the mellotron keyboards were put on afterwards um but all the you know everything you hear all the guitar solos they played live you know like old van halen records you know mm. Just kind of put it down if 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 you make a mistake, you know, if it was obviously like a really bad mistake, you'd patch it up. But but um, you just kind of go with it, and I think it adds um, you know, what it lacks in precision, it, it makes up for in in atmosphere. I think, and it was certainly a, an enjoyable way of of doing it, you know, because um, I ever, I've been making records a really long time, and two things I hate is having to just go in and do endless takes of like a bass guitar or something. Like, can't I just play it with the drummer? Cause it would just be much easier. Mm. And I hate singing with headphones on. I just can't stand it. So um, when I put headphones on, I feel like somebody's grabbing me around the throat. I find it really difficult to sing with headphones on. That, that and even sounds... though I did, I did actually sing most of it, this album with headphones on, on Forever in Starlight, I convinced um, the engineer, A.D. Hardy, who's a, fantastic engineer i was like you gotta let me sing this without headphones come on he was like okay <laughs> and um so so how did you do it so you just go in the control room with the speakers kind of and you play you've got to make sure they're not too loud otherwise yeah. it will come down i mean actually if you listen really carefully to the end of bread and starlight you can you can faintly hear really quietly tambourines in there which we were originally on the song and then I took them out, but you can hear them still on the vocal mic. So excellent. <laughs> so yeah, so like little things like that happen and which um I think kind of make it interesting if you're listening on headphones or you've listened to the album a lot. I mean I, I find it really fascinating now hearing um records I've been listening to for years and years. You suddenly discover weird noises and you know, or yeah. strange edits. You know, it's funny when you talk about Paul Stanley earlier, there's, uh, I really love his 1978 solo album, you know, the Kiss, when the Kiss did all the solo albums. Oh, yeah. And there's one of the tracks, I can't remember which track it is, but you can hear, like, if you listen really closely, you can hear this really bad drum edit where the kick drum just goes like, <laughs> and it's just in, in one of the songs, I think it's on, um, uh, which one, one is it on? It's on like it's all right or one of those type songs and you you have to i only listen because i've listened to it so many times one day i was like man that drum edit is really terrible <laughs> so, um, but it's fun hearing that stuff in in music you know yeah um, what, what's your favorite of the kiss solo records um well i think they're actually all amazing and um some kiss fans uh, uh, judge them by how much they sound like regular Kiss records, mm. which to me is obviously not the point of them, that they, they don't really sound like Kiss records. And I think, you know, Gene Simms' album is just incredible with all those sort of guest artists on it and the orchestrations and, you know, the fact that all the songs kind of sound a bit like the Beatles on it and stuff. <laughs> and um, I think they're great. And even Peter Chris's solo album, which people would just like, it's kind of like an easy listening album, you know. Um, but there's some great songs on that and he's got a fantastic voice, you know, but I think my, I don't know. I like them all for different reasons. I, I think Paul Stanley's solo album is incredibly exciting and just the guitar sound on it is just phenomenal. And then you've got like Ace's album, which is, you know, he, he doesn't go around the obvious sort of pop songwriting route. He goes down the real kind of almost like Black Sabbath here's a riff and here it is yeah. for five minutes, you know, and I love that. And all the kind of weird, and the, the fact that um, on his album, he, he was using the early uh, guitar synth, the Roland guitar synth, mm. and it's just totally out of tune. Like, and you listen to it and you're like, what? Well, it's completely out of tune, you know, but it's still on there. It's on the record. It's on, what's that song that it's on? Like, yeah, I think it's on Ozone. Um, and you've got all that, ding on it, all, all that stuff. And, yeah, I guess they hadn't think I don't know I don't know what the reason is it was out of tune anyway, but it is. <laughs> and um and I love all that stuff, you know, it's really it's uh it's really exciting. Uh, you know, I think when I was a kid, they were the first band that I got into that I discovered myself from because I was really into Marvel comics. 
and um, you'd see the adverts for the, for, it didn't even say that it was a band. It would just go, kiss, nothing, <laughs> you know? And it was like, what, what is this? Is it, are these some superheroes or what? And, um, and at the time I was really, just really, really into sort of music and, and um, you know, Marvel comics and Star Wars and then kiss come along and they're like, well, they're the perfect blend of science fiction and rock and roll. So, yeah. and, ju- and the fact that those, I think those seventies kiss albums are, are brilliant albums. You know, they're really great music and they're an odd band because I think they often, they sound quite different to how people think they're going to sound. You know, I remember one of my friends when I was a kid, not getting into them because he was like, oh, I fucking hate all that. Sorry, can my can I sort yeah. of <laughs> that? He was like, I hate all that kind of doomy, you know, heavy metal stuff. I just like ACDC and Whitesnake. And I was like, no, listen to Kiss. All that. <laughs> and he heard Alive too. And he was like, oh my God, they're amazing. They kind of sound like like a pop version of ACDC or something, you know? So Yeah. <laughs> I was thought there was a lot of similarities between ACDC and Kiss. People deny it, but I, I think they sound just the, the, the process of the songwriting is kind of like a riff, a vague sense of a melody, <laughs> then a catchy chorus, and often, you know, I, I thought there was, I mean, ACDC are, I guess the cool thing to say is they're much better than Kiss, but, and in a lot of ways they are, you know, I think they're on a, they're on a certainly on a different level musically to Kiss, but I like both bands, you know, I, I like, I, th- I think that they're both, you don't have to choose. Thank you. Much like the Kiss song. Oh, it's the opposite of Got to Choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, if it was up to Paul Stanley, you would have to choose. That'd be uh, weird if that song was about liking ACDC. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it is, secretly. <laughs> I've been having this conversation recently, and it's, I've had this conversation in my head a lot over the years, that you know, when Gene Simmons discovered Van Halen, uh, you know, he was obviously trying to get Eddie in to replace Ace. Yeah. What do you think Eddie's makeup would have been like? Wow. You know, I'd spend a lot of time thinking about Kiss, and I've never thought about that before. It's what would his makeup be? Nice. <laughs> My God. Because it, um... it, it wouldn't have been Vinnie Vincent's onk. I can't, that wouldn't have worked. But maybe that was, I don't know, because I, I think the thing with the Vinnie Vincent makeup was that, um, wasn't it really last minute where they were just like, oh, Ace isn't going to make the tour. Vinnie, you've got to. I think I heard something like that, yeah. And, and, uh, and, and actually, I love Vinnie Vincent's makeup. I think it's amazing. And I think, interestingly enough, I think that Creatures in the Night lineup, I think they look amazing before, you know, mm. Vinnie Vincent, Eric Carr, Gene and Paul, they look fantastic. It's a great, um, you know, they almost look more like a band than the Ace version of the Creatures lineup. Yeah. I think. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I don't know what, I, I mean, it would be strange to have Eddie Van Halen in Kiss. I'm not really sure how it would have worked because. I, yeah, I can't hear their guitars. styles. I can't, you know, I can't imagine Eddie fitting into I hadn't even thought of that. He'd have to play with Paul's rhythm, which doesn't make any sense. (laughs) But just his style of playing doesn't fit Kiss's songs at all. Yeah, and the fact he wears his guitar up high and that he smiles all the time, I think it just wouldn't have worked. So, (laughs) but I'm glad because obviously um, I love Van Halen. Yeah. We're very lucky to have those Van Halen albums. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. Before we get too much into other bands, I'm going to talk to you about, you also put out, a new single in April. There are two songs that are not on the album. Yes, yeah. So that's um, uh, Tears of Black Glitter and St. David of the Bleeding Heart, which are actually really old recordings. Um, so Tears of Black Glitter was actually recorded in, I think, 2003. Oh. And it's, um, I did that. Um, it's There's a video that goes with it and the, the, the released version is actually just the soundtrack to the the video, which was kind of, again, that's kind of live. Um, I did a duet with uh, an amazing singer called Grog, who uh, is in a band called Dice of Fluid. And um, uh, at the time, the, the, I lived in a, in a house with a bunch of people from 
that were in bands and artists and um, uh, Grog lived in that house and uh, Drew Richards, who plays guitar on my album and is also in Dice of Fluid, he recorded that. And um, yeah, that was a pretty crazy household. Also as well, there was a, a, do you know, an artist called Vanya Zaravliev, have you ever heard of him? He's a Russian artist that lives in London. He, um, He's this incredible artist. Um, he was living in the house and it was, it was really, um, it was a lot of fun living there. So we recorded that song um, and then made a video for it straight away. And um, yeah, so that's where that is. And, and that's just been kind of, around, I've had that around for ages and I never really put it out because it was, I figured, well, it's not, it's not like the studio version of it. So, um, but then in line with my, recent philosophy of like I'm just going to put things out you know if they, if they sound good I'll just put them out I'm not worried about them too much so and then the other song St. David of the Bleeding Heart was from um, around that time I was uh, producing a band called My Passion I don't know whether people remember them I and um, did they yeah, play you might Stay Beautiful them. they played Stay Beautiful I saw yeah. them at Stay Beautiful uh, yeah. they were yeah, very they were, intense yeah, very intense, very great band. And actually, they, they, it was before they'd become my passion, there used to be a band called Shard. And I was producing some demos for them with um, uh, uh, David Allen, who people will probably know, uh, produced The Cure and Human League. Um, and he's just an amazing character and wonderful musician. And basically, well, after we'd produced the My Passion stuff, he said, oh, there's some studio time coming up. Do you want to just come in and do one of your songs? So... Um, it's actually the drummer from My Passion is playing on that track and I'm playing bass and rhythm guitar and yeah, we just put that down as well and again it was not really I never really put it out before I, can't, I did I, I think I put it out briefly as a free download or something I don't know but that's quite an old song as well so is that, man I, I saw those two titles you know Tears of Black Glitter and St. David of the Bleeding Heart and I was like is he okay I mean it seems like yeah. I should see a doctor ASAP well, yeah, that's, I mean, when I wrote those songs, I was not in a, in a, in a good situation at all. So you're absolutely, your, um, your assertion's correct at the time of recording, but luckily it was um, a long time ago. So I'm much better now. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Also, I've, Tears of Black Glitter, man. Like when I was like 20 years old, my best friend told me that you can get glitter in your eye and it'll slice up your cornea. And ever since I heard that, I've been terrified of getting glitter in my eye. So when I saw that song, I was like, he's crying glitter. That's, that's just going to, you know, as the picture slice up eyeballs. Yeah. Yeah. It's a health hazard. I think, yeah, it is true. You don't want to get glitter in your eyes. It's not a good idea. Yeah. It doesn't seem so. Good. That, that tune actually reminded me of those early smashing pumpkins B sides, which I always really dug. It's sort of like, that sort of lilting feel to it. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Well, I, I'm not that familiar. I, I, the Smashing Pumpkin stuff that I know, I, I really like that uh, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness record. Mm. Um, but it's interesting, a funny thing happened when, when um, I moved to London and I started my band Rachel Stamp. And people would say, would hear us and go, oh, you, you must be reading Smashing Pumpkins. And at the time I was like, I've never heard them. I don't, I don't. <laughs> I've sort of seen the name, but I've never heard the records. I don't know them. But this is obviously before they were particularly popular. And people were like, you've even got like, one of your songs has the same lyric as the Smashing Pumpkin song. And I was like, really? And um, it was a song that I had called, Hey, Hey, Michael, You're Really Fantastic, that had a, the line, what's a boy to do? Or, or, or what's a boy supposed to do is in... Yeah, that's... In what's a, a boy to do is in it. And it's in a Smashing Pumpkin song. So this is the interesting thing. So a little while later, I was reading, I, was, I saw a magazine that had Smashing Pumpkins in it. And I read an interview with Billy Corgan and they were like, so what are your favorite bands? And he was like, Cheap Trick, Van Halen, and Black Sabbath, and a bunch of 80s pop. And I was like, well, that's why we sound similar because <laughs> we have the same, we're into the same music and, and making music at the same time is gonna come out in the same way. And that line, the What's a Boy to Do line, I stole it from um, Ola Moore by, um, uh, it's by Erasure, but I yeah. knew the, do the dollar version of it, you know. Ola Moore, what's a boy and love supposed to do? 
that's where I got it from. I don't know. I don't, I don't know where Billy got it from, whether he got it from the same song as me. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so I think there's definitely some sort of similarity, but it was coincidence. I think there's an interesting thing happens where um, I, you know, when, when I first moved to London and had my band going, I didn't really listen to other bands that were around that much. I was kind of too busy um, writing songs and rehearsing and stuff to really pay too much attention to what was going on um, with other bands. I was still listening to older music, you know, and um, because I had no money, I couldn't really afford new records. So I would go to the uh, record and tape exchange in, in Notting Hill in London and just buy, you know, like, I was buying like Linda Ronstadt albums and um, Missing Persons and, you know, and bands like Fanny and just th things that were, you know, you could, you'd go through them, you could, you could come out with like four LPs for six quid or something, you yeah, know, but yeah. all the stuff that nobody else wanted to listen to. But I was like, oh, this looks interesting. I'll get this. And, you know, um, a lot of music I, I listen to is, is, that, is that kind of stuff. So. I always found it weird that Van Halen covered Linda Ronstadt's You're No Good and had it the first song on Van Halen 2, no less. Yeah. Well, is, is that, um, who did it originally? Is it, because um, somebody did it before Linda Ronstadt, I believe. Oh, really? Okay. I think so, yeah. Um, but her version of it is great. I mean, Linda Ronstadt is wonderful. Like her version of um, Tumbling Dice, the Rolling Stones song. I, don't know I would, that. I would, I would say it's better than the Stones version, and um, I don't say that lightly either. It's no. great. But she did a bunch of. I got into Warren Zevon from being into Linda Ronstadt because she, she um, did several of his songs like um, uh, Carmelita, which we covered in Rachel Stamp, and um, she did Poor Pitiful Me, uh, Muhammad's Radio, um, several of his of his songs, and that's what got me into Warren Zevon. He's one of my favorite songwriters. Wow. So, yeah. Now, speaking of Van Halen, you have a very interesting theory. I do. About Van Halen and the Smiths <laughs> that I was hoping you could share. Okay, so a while ago, I came to the conclusion that this, so it's based on the principle of, of if, if, you, if you look at um, the UK and America, uh, similarities so like uh, I would say that London is more kind of like New York this is very loose and, and Manchester is more kind of like LA and I always thought there was um uh but when um Jane's Addiction first came out a lot of my friends got really into them and um I would listen to them I was, I was like they really remind me of Van Halen in some way and people were like, really? And I, I thought, yeah. And, and they also remind me of the doors. And I saw this real sort of lineage of LA, the sound of LA in these bands, even though stylistically they're very different. Mm. But, you know, there's something to me listening as a person from uh, the UK, that I hear something in it that there's like a lineage through all, all that LA kind of, so it's kind of fantastical, but also really in the gutter at the same time. And I thought that, you know, the Manchester music scene was kind of reminded me of that. And then I was like, um, I never liked the Smiths when I was growing up because I just thought they were like, because I was listening to Van Halen. I was like, why would you want to listen to the Smiths if you've got Van, <laughs> Van Halen? And then one of my friends, um, a great guitar player called Martin Shellard, um, he at the time was, uh, was um, transcribing uh, albums for the for the music notation mm. that you buy you know when you buy the book you know the yep. play the smiths so he did all the notation for that and i was joking oh man you have to transcribe the smiths it's gonna be like two months of hell and uh and he went no you know what they're actually brilliant you should listen to them and he gave me a, um, a copy of the uh, louder than bombs is that is that the, the yeah, I think kind of compilation cool. Yeah, and I listened to it and I was like, this is amazing. This is like what, they're, they're not what I thought they were. They're actually sort of, you know, very funny and the guitar playing is very innovative. Um, and whilst it has its roots in certain areas, you, you know, Johnny Marr really just didn't sound like anything and he was quite enigmatic. And, um, and you know, the singers, you know, if you, if you 
ask most people, what's Morrissey like? Oh, he's really, really miserable. But the records are actually very funny and very witty and have some, I'm talking about the Smiths records now. Yes. Everybody, not current Morrissey records. <laughs> and, you know, and Eddie Van Halen was, uh, and, and David Lee Roth was, people, generally you go, what's David Lee Roth like? Oh, he's this clown. He's this, it's like, well, have you listened to the records? Because <laughs> the lyrics actually have a lot of kind of pathos and depth to them. And um, uh, I've just used the word pathos, and I don't actually know what it means, but I think I know what it means. Um, so, you know, and they're, and they're a lot more, they're not what they initially appear to be, these people, you know, and there's this sort of, I suppose you could go as far as go, you know, in, in the early days, there was this sexual ambiguity to both of them, where you never really kind of knew what was going on which is sort of near neither here or there really but but interesting and and um and of course yeah the whole the, the, I mean, the a guitar player that massively changed guitar playing oh. um you know yeah eddie van halen completely changed the way people play guitar in america and johnny marr had a, did the same in the uk you know you wouldn't have all, all, all the kind of later indie bands just would not play that way if it wasn't for johnny marr and i think that you know, when I say they're the, to me, they're the same band on different sides of the Atlantic is what they are. Obviously they don't sound, they don't sound alike and they don't look alike, but the, but the, the key ingredients are the same. I feel. Yeah. I am right. You, you make a very good argument. So. <laughs> and I love both bands, you know, and you're right. They came along and changed everything. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, an interesting thing with music. I mean, when I was younger, especially, I was very into the whole sort of tribalistic aspect of things. It was like, I like Van Halen, I could never like the Smiths because they're just too different, you know. And then a few bands come along, kind of like, you know, you hear maybe like Duran Duran and you're like, oh, okay, I like rock music, but Duran Duran are kind of cool and, you know, they're kind of rock and you start listening to other things and then, you know, getting into things like, um, uh, just may maybe, you know, things like, you know, bands like Big Star, who were just wonderful, you know, and so, you know, all these barriers that I had when I, when I was a kid started to break down and now I just listen to whatever I want and if I like it, I like it. So. As it should be. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, people who are sort of snobs are denying themselves a lot of education and pleasure, I think. Yeah. You don't Education have to choose, and as we... pleasure. <laughs> Sounds like an album title. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, great. That's all my questions, man. Thank you much, very much for coming on the show. Do you have anything else you want to add? Anything coming up? Um, I'm just, well, I'm hoping to start recording like a, another album in the next uh, month or so, depending on the uh, lockdown rules. So, um, yeah, so just that really. And, and um, yeah, and the album that I made with Lux Lyle, which is called uh, Vamp, just came out. So if people like what I do, then maybe uh, have a listen to that. Lux Lyle? Um, Lux Lyle, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, also as well, I've been playing in a, in a really crazy band called Spiral Dial with, with um, uh, the sax player on my record, Liza Beck. Uh, she's put together this kind of crazy folk, jazz, electronic, <laughs> improvisational group called spiral dial that i play bass guitar in and um so yeah people might want to have a listen to that and, um, are these up on bandcamp yeah they're on bandcamp i think they're all on kind of uh you know itunes and spotify and everything oh. so everything's been released on, on all the digital platforms in all, all good record platforms. stores now <laughs> <laughs> so yeah excellent um, well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate it. Yes. You too, David. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Mr. Southpaw. <laughs>